let's dive directly into it because we only have 20 minutes and I have lots of slides. So BIP1, beam improvement number one. So schema, schema options. So I'm Alex, we already said this. Um, let's start with this quote actually. So a quote of a famous author, me. <laughs> um, everybody's talking about actually annotating Java, Python, .NET or something else. But why can't we do this in the Beam schema contracts? That's like, that was actually a problem before Beam uh, BIP one. So my problem is I have I work with like a lot of proto. Like this is an example of a proto schema. And if you before BIP one was implemented, um, put, gave that to Beam, and you were working with uh, schema where P collections, what was it retained? It was only this. You are like a message that maps to a row, and you have three fields with all the type information and the name. And that was it. But that was more than enough to work to make uh, Beam SQL work. But I was more interested in what, what was the original type. So that's that's completely lost. The improper is like tags, like the one, two, three. That's like the order uh, that's very important for the binary compatibility. Gone. What about my options that I defined? Like, uh, I was interested in what the description is, primary keys. I want to encrypt that key. All of the information gone. You're in Proto, you can do that as well to the row. Gone. So, bit one to the re rescue. But let's quickly recap what schema web P collections are. So, in, in B, normally you work with your raw data types originally, and it's called P collections around your type. So, if you work, were working in Proto, that was a P collection of Proto, Proto messages. Were you working with Avroad and it was uh, Avroad types or plain old Java objects, it were P collection of those types. But uh, but then schema where P collections came around and it gave some, some, some extra. And that was like type information, universally understand within the Beam ecosystem uh, of what that type information was. So. It, it was a layer on top of the, 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 the original type. So Proto, it's, it's, it made sure, okay, Beam can understand what those fields are instead of just working with the messages. Avro, the same, Pojo, or JSON, or whatever. And um, those schema where P collection, they are like a few built-in functionality to make it to a row. And that's what Beam SQL comes in, and from a row. So if you have a row, how to co convert that back to to your your typed type system? That was very interesting because it put like a layer on top of your your schema, uh, on top of your data. Data is just binary data internally, and um, and those functionality was kind of oh, this is that, this is that, this is that. And it did that in a non-destructive way, as long as you did non-destructive uh, uh, operations on it. So if you want to have like one field, it didn't transform that, it just accessed that field in a message or whatever. Yeah. But of course, there are uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, destructive information, and then you have like a, a row with storage. But it's like a container, a universally container of your data. Out of the box, you get those transforms, like add fields, casting, co-groups on those things, renaming fields, and so on. That you get out of the box. But what it really brings is Beam SQL due to those uh, transforms. And that's that's with like having the row and the type and the name is actually enough to make Beam SQL work. But yeah, I wanted to have like those extra information. So that's why uh, the one was introduced to add like a type system for those options or annotations or however you call it in your language to have that in Beam as well. The first we needed to have like an API. The API is like um, introducing like extra fields, like set options onto a field and a row. So both are, both are important. I'll come back to that later. So 
and we want to have like a strict typing. The nice thing about the, the API that was introduced is it uses the same type information as Beam is using. So you could have like a string type with an option that is a Boolean. And you do that with setting uh, uh, an option with that field type. It's, it's exactly the same kind of, it's just like you're setting an extra field on your field. And if you access them, um, it retains the, the type. But let's not stop with primitives. Eh? So it would be easy to stop there. But as you are using the, the field, field type mechanism of Beam anyway, it has arrays. So why not uh, add, it, uh, add the system to add arrays, maps, and very strictly typed. So you can hear here, here if you have a map with integers mapping to a string but even rows. It's pretty important, so certainly for, for me, like it was interested in the Proto implementation. The Proto implementation has very rich data structure. You could put in those options. We wanted to have them mapped into that. And with the primitives, the arrays, maps, and row, you can do almost everything. So, and why options on fields and rows? So. Typically, that's how it's stored internally. So you have your row, and here we have uh, at the top a row option, and then your fields, you have other type, other options as well per field, per each, individ each individual field. And here you see the interesting part how it links. So, you, so here the row, uh, that is an address, it can have options that says something about the address field, but it, points to a row, and that row has its own options, and there you can store like what is the original type. So here in this case, you can accept that it's kind of an address-like type. So okay. those things you, you store there, because it's not relevant to the field itself. You're talking about the row. So, and th that's actually what we learned the usefulness of having a separate storage of, of options in rows and things while implementing the, the protobuf implementation. Because we were first were talking, thinking only of storing those options in there, but um, those, but we were in, but we saw that with actually the type system we introduced, we can store the rest. Like setting the option, what the message is and the tag. And we did that by introducing like a namespace that uh, that Beam will actually introduce into your option. So if you add an option on your row or your field, it will add like a namespace uh, Beam option proto meta. It's very proto specific type name. And for the for the tax uh, option meta number. And so it will not clash with your own. Uh, with your own option names that you are free to define. So now we can add those those things as well. So, and with that system introduced, you can start thinking of your pipeline a different way. So it's a bit changing the mindset. Before you had like, typically you had to transform something, you do a do event on your, your type on this contract for the other types, for the other contracts. Say you have like hundreds of contracts, then you have, after that, you have like a mess of do events and pipelines and all those running. While almost on all of them, you have to do something similar, like uh, encrypt some fields here and there. And why, why would you write like specific pipelines on those for every contract if you can actually act upon like uh, those, that, that metadata or those options? So those options are actually available in the, the transform expand function. And on the, so you get like your, con, your contract, your data, your schema, however you call it. And at that time you have like access of those options. So say for example, you want to encrypt something, you search for something uh, in the type, this needs to be encrypted and you create a specific do event in your transform to do that. If your contract, or the schema looks differently. It's the same transform you use in expand function. You just do the encryption on other fields. 
and 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 you only have like one transform that does one specific or does a few specific things but you can reuse over all your contracts instead of rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding again. So what are our typical use cases uh, that are available? Um, or you can think of hundreds of things, but uh, I can name a few that are already used in practice. Uh, one is data quality checking. So it could be that in your enterprise, you have like contracts defined, but still you want to, before you move into your data lake, lake have some, some uh, data quality checks. And you can add on your, in my case, protobuf, uh, but it, it it works everywhere. It can do it in Avro as well. Um, define some some constraints. Uh, in Proto, there's like a an, an interesting thing. Like in the Envoy proxy, they have already some annotations or options defined up front, so you can reuse them, add them to your your, your messages. This float needs to be bigger than that float, or this number, or it needs to. Um, have this regular expression, and you can act upon that. So if you see those annotation, you can make a do event that does check on this. If it doesn't comply, you can send it to a deadline. Uh, another interesting use case I used to try in the, in the past was like, um, a lot of people will know the Bayesian. Um, it's actually the CDC chain data capture on databases. And it puts those in a stream of data. Um, the thing is, it uses like a lot of primitives, and like a lot of databases, the time, the type of a of a, a timestamp is kind kind of different. Sometimes it's stored as a string, sometimes as a number, sometimes a string with those formats. Luckily, the Bayesian adds some extra information in the schema where you can act upon. So here you can loop over your, your, your schema and see, oh, it's a string. Ah, it has an annotation, the Bayesian time zoned timestamp. Then I know I have to handle it like this. Or it's an int64. Maybe it comes from another database or databases have other ways of storing them. Okay, it comes in as an int64. Ah, but it has a timestamp. So in my pipeline, I can handle it like this. Or even like, uh, yeah. A byte, it's a byte, but it's stored as a decibel, decimal, and you can then handle it as a decibel and convert it to something, like if you want to have it in BigQuery or something, convert it to a, to a decimal and not as a byte. Um, in your expand function, you do not need to create like a lot of two events. You can actually create SQL on it. Like if you have like, a, encrypt this or remove this, just create a SQL statement out of it from the contract, that's also possible. So you do not need to to handle only, create only two FMs, SQL is, is possible too. Like like this example. So let's, let's have a, like an, an interesting end-to-end -end use case that's pretty interesting. And it's a GDPR use case. But you actually want to encrypt what, um, keys that are annotated. So I already mentioned a few times. So how would you go, go about it? So first have the requirements. So you want to encrypt personal information, PII's personal identifiable information. Each user uh, has its own encryption key. Why? Because you want to, to throw away that key if the user says, I don't want to be known anymore. But you want to keep some non-identifiable information. Why? Maybe for your own legal requirements, because you want to need the invoices need to be kept or something. So what are the building blocks? So the schema of options, of course, because that's what we're talking about. Um, we want to have it in BigQuery. Um, and we want to have it encrypt, encrypted. And we have, want to have like a way in BigQuery to still query it. Um, and BigQuery has some very interesting ways of having like uh, fields encrypted with a specific key. And luckily, there's a library that works with the same key technology. So there's a Google Think, uh, Think li uh, library it's, uh, found on uh, GitHub. And you can use that in your B pipeline. 
And for that, we need some uh, stateful processing. Why? Because we need some caching and so on. And we're going to store store our, our, our keys in big table because it needs to be transactional. Big query is not transactional, but we can still federate over over, over big table. So how it looks like? Um, because we have schema options, they are available in the expand function. Um, voila. Um, is it there? Yes. Okay. Then we'll create like a block uh, that does like the left part. Um, so we are going to have a stream that has per user uh, a row. And so we, because we want to have a separate encryption per key, that's why we split it up in a key value pair. And, um, and then is there a key already available? Yes, no. If there's not, we create one, store it in big table, and then we start encrypt encrypting. Is there a key in big table available? Then we get it. Because it's stateful processing, this uh, works out of the box. So you, you will make sure that those things get sequential and you don't have to, to uh, care about concurrency per user. But if you give it like a, a schema without any personal information, this will happen just, just pass through. So it doesn't use any uh, compute information to walk through, through the complete tree use, useless. So this is a naive implementation where you actually just go over then the row and see, ah, it's an encrypt key. We get, uh, we get a user, then we encrypt that, um, we encrypt for the user this field with that key, that function. This is naive, but uh, you can optimize this um, by by actually generating code. It's, it's a lot trickier, but when you start with this, just start naive and optimize it. What, what does it still need to be done though? So there's still an Avro one uh, open. So I got like this week some hints that people will start looking at it. So that's promising. So if there's not, not a lot of uh, uh, comments on there, the Avro implementation can, can go in. But it shouldn't stop there. There's also now a thrift implementation. I, I'm not a thrift expert, so if somebody's interesting on adding those, those information in the thrift as well, that would be cool. And there's decent schema, XML schemas, a lot of type systems that, that, uh, that have like extra information work, what could be interesting to have uh, in the... And, the SQL engine should be expanded to actually also work with those, or set them or even work with them. But uh, setting as an option, there's even like an option in the SQL standard where we can work with. Um, and that would be great. And in databases, in GDBC as well, there's also lots of metadata that we can push and pump into the system where you can act on it. And the portability, although it is in the proto between like the, the the languages itself, there is no implementation of um, of the the BIP implementation on anything except the Java implementation. Um, well, thank you. This was a very short imp implementation. I've opened kind of a meet, so if people have like questions, I'll open it up. Um, um, and that's that's it. Thank you. Perfect. We're right on time. Thank you, uh, everybody, for attending Beam Summit here, and thank you, Alex, for sharing. Thank you. Bye.